Well, hello and welcome back to the t Ruff, the Film Buff Podcast. This is episode six and the last episode that will be a review of the current season of Game of Thrones, season eight, episode six, called The Iron Throne. I thought for certain that this episode was going to be called The Dream of Spring, since that will be George R. R. Martin's last book, or even if they wanted to make a, you know, even less subtle title would be a song of ice and fire of course we got that nod towards the end of the episode but uh, nevertheless it's aptly titled uh, the iron throne which makes complete sense after seeing the episode and and i guess we should jump right into the reaction to this season really the the online reaction that, that social media has given this season um not just social media but really the internet in general and and after last week after episode five and episode four you kind of just figured there was no real win scenario for this series overall with Game of Thrones. There's no ending that would satisfy everybody. Um, but to me, I mean, I might be in the minority. I loved almost everything that this season has given us. Um, but I'm one of those people that's watched, that's watched the show uh, six times all the way through. Many of the episodes I've watched 15 to 20 times. It's just I just eat this stuff up. So it's, it's actually very hard to disappoint me in that regard. I just really, really love this world and these characters. So I'm just there for the ride. And yeah, sure, I do have favorite characters, you know, John and Jamie. And I, you know, no matter what anybody says in the internet, I've loved the direction they've taken those characters. So maybe I come at it with a different angle that I didn't have. Like Daenerys, I like Daenerys as a character, but... Is never one of my favorite characters, so maybe that's the the reason why I wasn't as disappointed with the direction they took uh, this season and that character in general. Um, some of the other characters as well. I just I'm more along for the ride uh, compared to some people that are in it for specific characters to take certain thrones or take certain positions in general to kill certain people to fulfill certain prophecies. I love all that stuff. I love reading about all that stuff, but. That's not where I come at the show from. Typically, it's more of just enjoying the ride, enjoying the world. I love predicting things. I love, you know, prophesizing things. But it's it's more of just enjoying how it how it comes out and, and dissecting it after. Um, so, taking a look at last night's episode, as I said, there's really no way to win um, for the show at this point in time. They've gone too far. There's been too many people invested in the show. They're, you're bound to disappoint some people. But I think that this was an excellent finale. I mean, you have the first half of the episode dealing with the after aftermath of, of Daenerys burning the entire King's Landing city to the ground, essentially, besides most of the Red Keep kept up, of course. Um, and, it, you know, you have the first half like that. So you have Tyrion, John, Davos kind of walking through the city in a very ominous, dark, uh, gloomy look on on the, the series in general. And, and I think that that the way the episode is structured is actually perfect to me because the first half is that gloomy, dark, dire, there's nothing really good happening. And that rep represents one half of what Game of Thrones is, which it really, for all intents and purposes, it's almost too real at how dark some of this stuff is, how, um, you know, non-hopeful it is at times. It almost mirrors the real world too much. And then you have the second half that's very much more hopeful and gives characters a send-off, a predictable send-off in a way, I guess you could say, and in a very hopeful direction for most, most of the characters. So it kind of represents the, the two sides of the coin. I actually ended up liking the, the direction they chose there. Of course, it's a little bit jarring when Tyrion... Uh, wakes up and it's like three weeks later and you don't get those three weeks um, in the finale's timeline there and you don't get what happens to John right after he kills Daenerys, that sort of thing. Of course, it's a little bit jarring, I guess. Um, but but looking back and, and watching it a few times since the premiere on Sunday night, I, I think um, it really does flow well and I, it is interesting. And maybe I would have felt differently if I would have recorded this normal time on, on Monday or or Sunday night, but coming at it on, on Wednesday, I, I really, 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 really do love the way they they structured the uh, the episode. And I, I one of my favorite scenes um, is 
you know, well, favorite moments is Daenerys walking out into the, you know, the very Hitler-esque Germany, Nazi-esque army of the Unsullied and Dothraki cheering her on after she burned an entire city to the ground and she has the, the wings of Drogon behind her. She walks out. That's fantastic. Fantastic cinematography, editing, all of the above, special effects, CGI, everything. Daenerys herself, Amelia Clark, gives a great performance in that scene. Um, you have Tyrion finally basically saying i give up like this is not this is not what i signed up for yeah sure i let my brother out um but you burned half a city or the whole city like i love the way that that dialogue plays out there dinklage once again is killing it does he deserve an emmy absolutely he deserves another emmy i don't care how much backlash the show has gotten the show deserves to me to me it deserves all the emmys it it, it can get so um i love that and then you kind of go from there uh, you know, John still trying to be that Ned Stark in him, tr trying to find some sort of of uh, reason to cling on to Danny and keep his honor and keep his word that um, that he's going to stay true to to bowing down to Daenerys, to bending the knee. Um, I love that they do show because J John, as a character, that's always been who he was. He's not quick to just jump on the other side of somebody and turn on somebody. He's He's got honor, and that should, he really was in love with Daenerys as much as you may think that uh, maybe they didn't have enough scenes together, they didn't develop that romance enough, but he has enough uh, gravitas as a character that um, you know I bought into the, those moments where him and Tyrion are talking about what he has to do, and and I love that Jon makes that callback to, to Aemon Targaryen telling him all the way back in, I believe it was, season one when he told him um, that you know, love is the death of duty. And Amen talks about all the previous times that, that he had to, um, you know, put put aside his, his love for his family, for the duty he has in the Night's Watch. And uh, that, was, that was a great callback. And I love Tyrion's turn on that, that line and saying that sometimes, you know, duty is the death of love. And uh, it doesn't completely click with John right in that moment, but... Um, you know, something is the wheels are turning a little bit. And then when Tyrion mentions this things about his sisters, um, and you know, the wheels turn a little bit even more. And that's kind of when he, when he finally goes to Nairs, he's kind of, he's still wanting her to, to convince him to not kill her, um, in those moments. But at the same time, once she says, you know, the future generations, you know, will not get to choose or what, whatever those lines were, it does click in his face. You could see that that turn in Kit Harrington's performance there. He's like, man, I really got to kill her, don't I? I really, really do. That's the only way in this situation here. Because if you don't kill Daenerys, she, like she said in that speech, she's just going to go on liberating everybody. And her version of liberating everybody is essentially wiping the slate clean of the rule that's currently in place and um, making the, the new generation not uh, having to obey to a tyrant, which is, of course, ironic because... She's kind of, in a way, a tyrant herself, but um, be that as it may, you have you have that sense of going back to John killing Daenerys. What a fantastic, fantastic uh, development that is in in those two characters. And and sure, you can kind of predict it from last week. Um, There's really only way one way that it had to end. And Daenerys had to die, and and John had to had to pull that trigger. Um, of course, it's not a trigger, but it did, you know, he had to pull that knife out and kill her. Um, I do, you know, it was interesting the way I, I was wondering if they were going to do it in a way that, like, you know, Jamie killed her father back, you know, see it in the show until the, the brand flashbacks, but still, like, in a way that it, he would come from behind or something and do it. But it does fit that, um, you know, John, he's just gonna, he's gonna give her a hug, give her one last kiss, and then just done dunzo right in the heart um it's not you know it's not a gratuitous scene there's very little blood it's it's not a very grandiose scene it's just nice calm boom done uh, and then of course you're, you're just waiting you're waiting for that, that dragon scream 
uh, Drogon to, to cry out for his mother dying. And of course, and, and I love br- briefly, I, I love when John's walking into the red keep and, and Drogon's like hiding under all that snow and, and he comes out of nowhere and just kind of stares him down and lets him in. That was, that was perfect. It's ultimately unnecessary. Like if you had to cut something, if, if, you know, HBO was one of those uh, networks that was cut, making you cut something for time, I guarantee that would be something that was cut for time. But I love that because it's the finale kind of include all these extra little scenes and just add just a little bit more character to, to, to each of the scenes. And you kind of get the same thing later when Tyrion is rearranging the chairs anyway. Um, and then you have, so you have Drogon and, and John kind of in that, in the throne room together and, and oh it's just so devastating watching Drogon try to you know nudge Daenerys back alive with this little claw and oh man it's it's devastating as much as maybe Daenerys went off the rails in the last couple of weeks you still you, you still care for her you know you you still your heart breaks for Drogon in that moment of course it's perfect he kind of realizes like the dragon is smart enough to realize what killed Daenerys in that moment it's not it's it is John, but it's not John. It's ultimately the throne that lust for power. As much as she says that, you know, it, it's not so much the power of it. It's the the mercy for the future generations. It's her birthright for the throne. It's ultimately it did corrupt her. The poison of the throne corrupted her. Um, and and I do love that. You know, they kind of faked you out. They, they act like Drogon's going to burn John, which of course, in a way, could they could somehow pull the. The left turn that John doesn't burn just like Daenerys. But John isn't a full Targaryen. Daenerys is more full Targaryen. So uh, I bought that. Plus, in season one, he does kind of burn when he holds that that um, the the fire and, and killing the the White Walker that was going after the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. So you know, I I would have probably not have liked it as much if he burnt John there or if he even killed John there. I completely understand where fans would have wanted that. I think it would have been cool. It's just I like the way that the direction they went him burning the throne and whether or not he's actually burning the throne on purpose or, or not, or he's just kind of letting out anger and the fire just goes right into the throne and it burns, whatever. It's very symbolic and very, um, God, there's a lot of history on that chair, right? I mean, I, man, I mean, how many scenes have we had in that room? How many different people have sat on that throne throughout this, this show? Oh man, it's, that was that was a moment. I love Raman Jawadi's music in that scene as well. Um, so, so all that was great. Um, then you kind of have from there, you kind of fade to black and you have the time jump like I was just mentioning. And uh, again, a little bit jarring. Maybe Grey Worm would have just killed Tyrion and Jon in that moment. Maybe he would have. Maybe he's not killing them because he's trying to obey Daenerys in that, uh, you know, Daenerys is what a final wishes i don't know what what he thinks he's doing what he thinks he's not supposed to be doing because daenerys is dead now i don't I, you know I, i'm not gonna nitpick like that it's it's like nitpicking that that how was gray worm already on top of the, the stairs before john was when john passed gray worm earlier in the episode when gray worm was killing all those soldiers it's like yeah i get it i get it it's nitpicking stuff. Like, do we do we need to sit and, and dis- dissect those little tiny moments? Why can't we dissect the show as a whole uh, and the characters, not those like technical flaws, like the Starbucks coffee a couple a couple weeks ago, the water bottle um, this week, and then last week people thought it was Jamie's hand, but uh, you know that was just a photo they released on accident. Jamie's golden hand is in the entire episode. It's not. They didn't. They didn't make some sort of mistake. Anyway, I just think it's too much. It's too much of this toxic fandom, social media crap. Um, but anyway, so then we kind of get to that council scene that, that where everybody from basically all the kingdoms, you have Yara, the new Prince of Dorne, Sansa, Arya, Bran, Davos, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, John Aaron, or not John Aaron, Robin Aaron. I'm sorry, John Aaron's the his father that was killed in the first episode, but Robin Aaron um you have um samuel tarley um you have edmir tolly making a surprise appearance that was interesting so you have all these different uh folks together in one circle and then you have gray worm bringing out Tyrion. they're kind of figuring out what do we do now so we have john as prisoner and all that stuff and sure maybe you can make the case that it was a little bit weird that john's not in that scene together he doesn't get to defend himself or anything but john 
John, that John wouldn't defend himself in that way. He kind of knows what he did. And I think John's ready to, to pay for, for whatever he punishment he gets. Right. I mean, that's just, that's who that character is. So didn't completely mind that you have, uh, oh, the, the moment when Edmir totally tries to stand up and declare himself worthy for the throne or whatever he was trying to say. Brilliant. Having Sansa say, you know, uncle sit down, you know, we don't, we, we don't need you. Okay. What are you doing here? You're just, you're just here by, by, uh, by title. Really. There's no, there's no other reason for you to be here. Um, you have Yara speaking up for Daenerys still after what she did, which I guess could make sense. You could make the argument that Yara would still be on Daenerys's side. And, um, at that point, it really just comes down to Tyrion's final little monologue that again, may get him another Emmy and, he comes to the conclusion that Bran the Broken would be, you know, the the best uh, fit for the Iron Throne, and of course, this is where this is where most fans completely checked out, from what I understand. Um, to me, does it feel weird that Bran, who spent an entire season not on the show, is the last one on the coveted Iron Throne that is just symbolized so much on this show? Is it is it weird? Maybe, but when you look at it from a holistic point standpoint, it makes complete sense. If if everybody there and half of them were supporting Daenerys, half not so much, if they were really trying to honor what she was actually trying to do, and which was breaking the wheel, yeah, that speech earlier in the episode about how much she wants to break the wheel, she's mentioned it so many times in the show. If you're truly trying to honor that, the only real answer is Bran Stark or the Three-Eyed Raven. He's the only one that's not attached to emotion. He's not He's not going to make decisions that are um, sporadic or that are, um, you know, jumping to conclusions. He's, he's going to, he sees everything. Um, now, will I say that the moment when he says, now, why do you think I traveled all this way to get here is a little weird because they're almost insinuating that he was planning for this. Maybe it's a little weird because they didn't fully flesh that out, but that's just essentially saying that he has the green sight, right? He, he has the ability to see what's coming in the future. That doesn't mean he's actually changing the future. He accidentally changes, uh, or not really changes, Hodor's always, it was always meant to be, a Hodor's story is always meant to to be what it was his just it was you know him going back in time just visiting that scene while he was working into hodor in the future or in the present i mean that just kind of happened but he's never actually been changing the future in my point of view he's seen what's happening a couple scenes for now what he needs to do to get to that point it's not like he can actually change it it's always inevitable right thanos in the, the recent avengers movie says i am inevitable i'm always going to happen so it's kind of the same thing like the future in this at least from my point of view bran knows what's coming whether he likes it or not he's never shown that he actually wanted the throne anyway so i it, it's not like i believe he was manipulating people into getting him into that position but so him just, uh, you know, saying that line is more of like, yeah, I needed to do things so we can get to this point because that's what the future is. And that's the best possible position that everybody would be in having Bran be the ruler. Again, I know people wanted John to be on the throne. I know people wanted Sansa to be on the throne. Here's the thing. Sansa was never going to go back to King's Landing. I'm surprised she even showed up in this episode because – I, I never believed that she wanted to go back to King's Landing, that the place that had tormented her for years on the show, she belongs in the North. She was always asking about the North to Daenerys. What about the North? What about the North? We've always stayed independent. We've always said we're never going to bend the knee again. So that to me fit perfectly. She was never going to be the throne on the throne. John was never going to be on the throne. He didn't want it. They were not going to do the Lord of the Rings route and have, uh, what's his name? Oh God. I'm drawing a blank on the name, but uh, Aragon, isn't that his name? Aragon, whatever. He, he, he ends up on the throne in the end of Lord of the Rings. That I don't think they were ever going to go that route. So uh, be that as it may, again, it just makes sense. If they wanted to break the wheel, Bran was going to be the only one. And of course, you have Tyrion as the new hand there. And I love that Bran says, you know, yeah, you've spent years of making mistakes, but you're going to spend the rest of your life trying to fix all those mistakes. That to me 
that to me worked. I completely bought into his logic there. Tyrion was always the best hand the show has ever had when he was in King's Landing. And I think the only reason he wasn't a great hand to Daenerys is just because it wasn't a right fit. The way she wanted the rule wasn't the way Tyrion um, was was ruling as hand of, to Joffrey in season two. It just wasn't it wasn't the same thing. So um, in terms of the, the route they went there, um, I love that Tyrion ends up there. Uh, you have the new small council, essentially, with Sam as the grand, grand maester, uh, Samuel Tarly, Bronn as the master of coin slash lord of high garden, whatever. Man, you know, Bronn still, to me, hit Bronn's arc in this season. I love the character, but just doesn't make any, just, just doesn't make any sense to have him be a central part. I guess he wasn't a central part. He really only had three scenes, but um, whatever, you know, whatever. Is he a smaller part in the books from what I hear? Yes. So did he deserve all this? Maybe not, but, you know, whatever. We got to that point. Davos is the master of ships. Brienne is the um, the war commander of the Kingsguard. Love that stuff. Love that stuff. It's perfect. You have Brienne finishing Jamie's page um, in the, the Book of Knights or whatever you want to call it. That's fantastic. And you see in Gwendolyn Christie's eyes that there's so much going through her face in that scene. She wants to hold back. She wants to write everything she can about Jamie and, and what he meant to her and what he did to her essentially. So, but she can't, she's just going to go be straightforward. Just, um, you know, write what, write what is true about him, right? How honorable he ended up being. And, um, you know, how he went back, he, he went back for his queen. He went back to protect his queen, which was Cersei all along. So, uh, lo love that sequence there. Uh, then you kind of have the the montage sequence at the end, and that that brings us to the the actual final moments of the show. And you have Arya uh, going west of Westeros. You have Jon going back to the Wildlings and the Free Folk slash Bean in the Night's Watch, and then uh, Sansa being the Queen of the North. And man, does that last scene with all the Starks kind of hit you, right? I mean, man, that brought me to tears the second time I watched it. That's how much they've been through. Uh, together really more apart than together it, it's funny you spend five six seasons with them all apart but every single second they're on screen you always feel like come on get get, get to each other get to each other Bran has a couple of run-ins with John but hasn't able to talk to John Arya is almost so close to her family like three different times Sansa has so many moments where she could have made a different decision to get back to her family but ultimately they ended up together all four of those remaining left Starks alive. Great, powerful last scene. It's just fitting where everybody went. And it, of course, maybe people think it's kind of sad that that they are all apart when they spent so many years uh, too far away from each other to even um, come in contact. It fits. I'm telling you, I, the way they ended pretty much every character on the show I can't think of a better way to end. You even have Grey Worm going off to Noth, uh, Narth or Noth, um, to kind of fulfill Masande's wishes. That's, you know, as much as Grey Worm kind of became a jerk in the end, that's fitting. That's fitting to me. It's slightly beautiful as well. So uh, that was great stuff. I loved it. I love that uh, that that the the scene with Arya on the ship kind of mirrors her her uh, her going off to Bravos at the end of season four. That's perfect because that was really when, when she was feeling the most whole, when she was exploring, when she was going to new places, when she didn't have uh, maybe the the obligation to go back to family. So love that. Sansa um, always been linked to being a leader of sorts. She always kind of wanted uh, to be a queen. So it fits that she's a queen, but she's a queen at home. She's a queen of the North and when they're all cheering Queen of the North, just like they were cheering King of the North, Rob and John. That's special. That's special. And it completely fits that John goes to the Night's Watch, Castle Black, and everybody's there. And then he's just they're kind of like, you know what? No. We're 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 not we're not we're not gonna we're not gonna stay here. Uh, we're just gonna go. So, you know, that 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 completely fits. They go north of the wall, which Love that. Completely mirrors the first scene of season one when you have all, and I mean 
all, all those scenes, uh, I, I should only say one, you have that one scene of those three Night's Watch members going out into the forest and, and seeing the White Walkers for the first time completely mirrors the finale here when you have all those wilding of free folk uh, walking directly right into where the danger used to be, and now they're building a new life. To I mean, that's... God, I get it. I get it. People didn't like this season, but... Man, I, I sometimes I just I just don't understand how it could get this this much hate, right? It just it's unbelievable, man. It's unbelievable how much of a, a divide I'm on than the rest of the the fans, the rest of the fan community, and everybody else, right? It's just it's it's interesting the way that there's so much a divide on this season, um, and of course in the previous seasons as well. Some things have been controversial, but. I mean, nothing compared to this season, right? It's it's pretty, pretty freaking crazy. Um, but let's let's go ahead and get to the final thoughts here. I don't want to uh, spend too much time on just ranting on social media and all that crap. But um, really, final thank yous. I mean, it's David and Dan building this series out, HBO for giving them the creative freedom to do what they wanted to do, um, to make it as graphic, as violent, but also as heartfelt. Is beautiful. The cinematography has always been great. The budget that they've given them the last couple episodes, or the last couple seasons, I should say. The cast. I mean, talk about the cast. Look at the look at these guys. I mean, how excited am I to see everybody else or the whole cast do more good things? I mean, you have veterans like Dinklage and Nikolai Coster Waldo and Lena Headey who've been doing this for years. You know, Liam Cunningham doing this for years, and all those guys. But then you have, you know, a young, the younger cast, like Amelia Clark, who's only been able to flex her uh, talents in a couple of movies. Can't wait to see what else she does. Uh, Sophie Turner, which has the X-Men movies, but can't wait to see how she maybe dives into another TV show, uh, something else. Maisie Williams, she's fantastic in a couple of movies I've seen her in, even though the movies themselves haven't been that great. But she has, you know, New Mutants coming out at some point. Uh, John Bradley, who I've been hard on in the past but i think he was fantastic this season in his couple of scenes uh isaac hempstead wright who again i don't think they ever gave him the true freedom to explore his talents on this show but he's been uh he's been fantastic and then you have uh you know uh, various other people but really it comes out of kid Harrington. the guys i can't wait to see what he does you know um whether it's a star wars movie joining with david and dan or it's just another series more hbo stuff he's been doing hbo stuff for the last couple of years aside from Game of Thrones. Um, so so that should be interesting, but that's the cast. Ram and Jawadi, I've already mentioned in this episode, what a fantastic, fantastic part of the show he's been. Uh, constantly, even when the show has been maybe divisive, his music has always been universally loved. Finally, George R. R. Martin. I mean, how can, how can you not? How can you not? This guy is brilliant. Um, I can't wait to actually dive into the books now that I'm finished with the show. That should be fun, whether it's the actual books or audio book. Who knows? But um, I guess I'll go ahead and rank the seasons before we sign off here. To me, uh, my least favorite season is season five. Just too too dark, too dire. It's nothing really good happens for any character. Then you have season three. Too many meandering plots. Again, I love every season, but we're ranking remorse to best here. So season five and season three. Uh, coming in at number six is season two. Great season. Just not better than the others. Uh, coming at number five would be season seven. Again, great season. Uh, brings together fire and ice for the first time. But then you get to season one at number four, season eight at number three. And my two favorite seasons is season four and season six. To me, that's when the show was at its best. Um, but man, man, oh man, oh man. There will be more time in the months to, to come just to dissect the show, take a step back, review, you know, how we felt overall. But I really, really, really did love it. And I love the way that they, um, I love the way that they ended. I know it's hard to stick the landing, but to me, they did. And so for now, and for one final time, my watch has ended.